once I got back into that rhythm of, of painting and, you know, the gratification, it's just, it's unspeakable how, how much you can get from it. Hi, listeners, and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the Palette. I'm your host, Whitney Rosenson, owner of Art Dimensions, a fine art leasing and sales business. And I want to thank you very much for listening in today. I'm so excited. Today, I'm going to be chatting with John Hudson, a fairly new artist on my roster, an excellent painter, and an excellent human being. Hey, John. (laughs) Hi, Whitney. Thank you for uh, for having me. Oh my gosh, you're welcome. Yeah, this is exciting. I haven't. I have to be honest. I haven't done one of these before, so it's it's nice, and you know, it's sort of a nice way of exiting out of this pandemic that we've been into for a long time. Because you know, things are just sort of. It feels like things are getting back to normal, and hopefully, yeah. yeah. Well, welcome, welcome. Yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> Um, Thank you for joining me today on the Art Dimensions podcast, and I know you're busy, so I really appreciate your time. So let's dive in. I know that you used to be, I don't know if our listeners know this, but I know you used to be a designer. Can you tell us a little bit about that, and how does your designing experience influence your paintings now? I would definitely say there's some crossover from a graphic design standpoint, you know, there's always the color, there's always the composition, there's, you know, there's a lot of those things that your eye is just sort of trained to do, because I've come from that design world for so, so many years. Being a designer can be very limiting. When I became a designer, you know, I started painting a little bit at an early age, and then I became sort of a designer, went to art school, and I felt that you know, in art school, you get, you know, I was looking for something a little bit more stable in my life. You know, that question of growing up and, you know, in those years of like, well, God, what do I want to do with my life? Do I, you know, do I want to just jump in and be an artist? Do I want to be, get into more design? And, you know, art school came around and it was at the time I, I felt that I needed a little bit more like stability from coming from a childhood that was so unstable and so many pieces moving. And, you know, I just, with design, I just, it was my, my calling at that time. It was, it was something stable. It was structured. It was, gave me like a foundation to sort of build from that. I had never, I just haven't, hadn't had that, you know, in my life and growing up in, you know, Southern California. And there's just so many, aspects to growing up in that childhood and once in, I got into art school and and design you turn into I turned into this like crazy perfectionist my point being you really have to be able to separate yourself from yeah your typical projects and you've got you know you've got the clients you've got 20 revisions you've it's just very difficult and so this is crazy so the one valuable thing that I learned from art school four years go by my teacher he could tell that I was just sort of a little bit of a perfectionist I was very sort of structured and again that's sort of what got me there but he told me that everything that you've learned you have to unlearn I will be honest I felt in design I had to work twice as hard to accomplish what my vision was and it, it's a it's a struggle and I I never truly felt the freedom that I should have been feeling what sort of things were you designing well this was everything from brand design logo design poster design you know and and I worked with a lot of great designers you know my in, uh, internship with April Grime and she was just a life she was a life changer she was a, amazing you know, really well known from like establishing what the Macintosh really was doing at that time and pushing everything and opened the doors for a lot of people. It was hard for me to unlearn that. And so for all these years, it was I forced. When I started painting again, 
I gave myself almost like a project, almost like a lesson. And so there was one logo that I always loved a lot, and it was New York Times. The type design, the curves, the straight edges, it to me was an art form. I'm, I really, and at this point, I, I wanted to get back into painting because, you know, I'd come from working 78 hour work weeks for many, many, many years. Finally had this job where I could like break away a little bit, you know, break away on the weekends at nights. And so I gave myself this project with the New York Times. I'm like, I'm going to paint that logo black and white on one canvas, this sort of like perfect sort of what I typically would do outlines and you know some paint drips and then at the bottom I was going to add this like getting away from being a perfectionist so that was that was one idea that I had and the other idea is like I'm going to throw all the rules out and just be completely like try to force myself out of this perfectionist it's a no lose situation it was purely for experiment and if I had to redo it 20 times I was in the mindset where it didn't matter because I knew the other canvas I was going to hang in my house one way or the other I had it in my head that it was going to look cool and I see it in my living room I see it hanging and it was purely for myself and so I tackled that the first one, which was that more perfect lines, everything, you know, it turned out great. I, I was really happy with it. And then this other experimental version, the same painting, but just can let all rules out. Kid you not, it, it changed my life. I had no idea. It was, it was incredible. It's to this day, it's hard to explain what was going on in my head at the time and what was, how gratifying it was. And you know, to be able to break away from being that sort of designer, that perfectionist, everything needed to be, you know, just right. I, I understood that in order to achieve greater things, you, you've got to break away. Good for you. That's great. If I was to just follow that design path, it can be extremely very limiting. And so what or what do you paint with? After, the, after that series of New York Times paintings, I sat back and I'm like, wow, I, you know, I, I really, I can achieve something that I've had in my head for a really long time. But I was still battling that perfectionist of like, okay, well, I don't want to just paint on, on canvas. I, I, I need a purpose. You know, that's the other thing about being a designer. There's always got to be a sort of a purpose for, you know, whether it's client-based or and I felt that in order for me to truly be happy in that sort of conceptual world of how do I achieve what I want, I wanted to use materials that meant something to me that was just going to be a little bit more than, than canvas. You know, I'm very comfortable with working on canvas, figure out different ways of applying paint or pencil or ink onto a different surface. And so then I got it. I thought, how cool, because I grew up surfing as well. And I'm like, how great would it be to figure out how to paint on fiberglass? And it's not new. People, people have done it. But usually with fiberglass, you have to put foam behind it, like surfboard construction. And so I thought it was going to be pretty easy. Like, oh, I could just go to a, you know, a surfboard shaper and get some advice and say, hey, I just want to stretch this piece of fiberglass across a wood frame and, you know, and put some resin on it and paint on it. And they were like, yeah, no, that's, we just don't do that. You have to put foam behind it to be able to stretch it. And I'm like, no, there's got to be, there's got to be ways. And so I experimented a great deal. I just bought a ton of like, they were 16 by 20 wood frames. I, I constructed those. And so then I started like trying to stretch this fiberglass and fiberglass is really sensitive because you've got the, it's a, it's a weave. And if you stretch too much, it just breaks apart. And then if you don't stretch enough, then you have this piece of fiberglass that's just sort of buckling and it. That's not, you can't paint on that. And so, you know, it took probably, you know, maybe 10 attempts of pouring this resin over the fiberglass having it dry, then you've got to worry about the drips and very, very difficult. 
you know, I was getting closer and closer. And then finally I, I nailed it and ended up like, wow, this is, this is incredible. Like I can paint on fiberglass with nothing behind it. I love the fiberglass aspect, but also I, I'm a huge fan of architecture and it's one of my main sources of inspiration. I can start giving these paintings more depth because they're, you know, you can see through these and, and you can, you can add whatever you want. You can add another painting. You can add a painting on canvas back there. You can add a wood sort of structure back there. You can paint on the back of it. You can paint on the front of it. It just opened all the doors to everything that I was passionate about. That's what was my goal was when I, before I really dove into getting back into painting is I want to be very passionate to what I'm painting on and have it be a part of me. The other reason why I love painting on fiberglass is because it's so unpredictable. It like canvas is very predictable. You know, the way that the paint sits on it, the way that the paint is going to drip on it, the way that spray paint, pencil, like it all is sort of predictable. Whereas fiberglass, each time the paint goes on differently, that art, it ties back into me being a, a perfectionist at that time. You, you have a little control of what's going on on the fiberglass, but at the same time, you, you know, a, enough control to where you can achieve what you're trying to do. But there are so, there's so much trial and error. It's tough to also produce a lot because it does, it's such a process to make the, um, the fiberglass around the wood frame and, and make sure that the stretch is right. Then you got to resin it. By the way, these smells are, I've, I'm sure I've killed a few brain cells along the way. <laughs> it's a process before the painting even starts, but that's what I love about it. The fiberglass and the wood frame and the, it becomes more part of the painting than painting on canvas. Well, I just want everyone out there to check out John's paintings, which are so dynamic and amazing. They're on artdimensionsonline.com. And when you go to the homepage, you just click in the upper right-hand corner where it says artists and find his name and then click uh, the thumbnail and it'll take you to his page. You can see everything that he's talking about. When did you make that shift from designer to artist? It did start um, at an early age. You know, when I was in high school, I was paint. you know, I, I, I had a little bit of that designer in me, but I also, you know, I grew up with two very gifted artists. My, my mother, who is just, she's been a lifelong inspiration, absolutely an incredible artist, no matter what medium she picks up. And she's picked up a lot from photography to painting, oil painting, like across the board, she's, she's really amazing. And um, my uncle, who's a well-known uh, sculptor, starting far back in the 70s, I, I, fortunately, I spent a lot of time with him growing up. You know, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate in a lot of things that I was able to do and to see. And, you know, my mind was expanded at a very early age of what the industry is, how it functions. And, and I started even going out to New he, he's moved to New York and like early in the seventies. And so I was going out there even as a young kid. And then I started going out there in the summers during school and being an art assistant. You know, I learned so much about material. And at the same time I was, you know, I was painting, I was always attracted to like the Roy Lichtensteins, the, the Warhols, you know, the James Rosenquist and David Sally and all these that sort of tapped into a little bit of the design slash art. And so I was just like making paintings in high school that basically replicated a Lichtenstein that, you know, busting out my best primary colors. And in hindsight, they probably weren't great, but it was fun. Do you still have those? I wish I did. When I, I took them to art school with me, I would love to see those. I had no room. So I'm like, hey, I let my friend keep my paintings in his like garage or something. And I, to this day, I don't, I have no idea where they where are. Where they are. <laughs> I'm really bummed about that. 
you know, growing up being a part of that, that art world, you know, I learned so much. And, and I think that's also where the pressure came in of what I wanted to paint. And then it, it comes full swing around to that art school where, okay, I, I want something a little bit more stable. And I started painting again a lot just six, seven, probably six years ago, stepped it up again. And, you know, there, that's a huge gap, but that design was a big part of my life. And although I said it wasn't gratifying, you know, there was a few moments here and there, but it's just nothing like painting. Once I got back into that rhythm of, of painting and, you know, the gratification, it's just, it's unspeakable how, how much you can get from it and the emotions that you go through when you're creating these paintings. And, you know, it's just something that design just can't, it cannot, it, it can't do. Some people will have a different response to that for sure. Like me being that perfectionist, that's how I, that's why I always had that tough time between getting gratification from design versus painting. What about painter's block? Do you ever get painter's block? And if so, how do you deal with it? I, you know, with painting, I, I have not come across that yet, just because I think I've, it's been pent up for so many years, um, wanting to be an artist. I, and once I discovered that experimental side that I dug deep for and, you know, discovered the materials of, you know, the fiberglass and the canvas and then mixing the two together. And then it's just this well of ideas that I've yet to tackle. And even the, the new series that I'm starting. What is it called? Well, it, it is part of the, that skyscraper and that's sort of the start of it as that was, as this is progressing. I'm, I'm starting to mix the two back together of the canvas and the, and the fiberglass and, and mixing the two together for either whether it's a composition layout or, and so I'm really, really excited how it just opens so many doors. I'm, I'm excited for the next many years to come. I feel like I've really come to the, the vision that I've, I've been trying to achieve for a long time. Awesome. You, you just have to check it out on my website. The, the, the works are just incredible. Do you remember the first work of art that you ever sold? Yes, it was one of those Lichtenstein ripoffs. That <laughs> I, I shouldn't say that. It wasn't a ripoff. It was definitely heavily influenced by a, a Lichtenstein. But my buddy who was managing, I used to skateboard a lot. And so I was skateboarding for this one shop in Los Angeles and he was saying oh hey your your paintings are incredible why don't you hang one in the shop and and I'm like god it's so weird it doesn't really fit in like this skate shop kind of vibe but in hindsight it actually did we he put it up in the window and everything and it like sold pretty quick and that was what I think I was like 15 or 16 or something Oh my gosh. And of course, take this giant gap where I didn't sell anything for a long time. So yeah, that was, that was the first. That's so, okay. So you were a teenager. That's very young. That's amazing. What's the hardest thing for you about being an artist? Putting yourself out there as, as an artist is so difficult. When I first started painting a lot again, and I had somewhat a body of work. It wasn't as cohesive as I was hoping, but for first go, I found the other art fair. I'm like, I'm just, I just got to go for it. it. It's so difficult. And, you know, I'm also the type of person that I, I've never wanted to tap into connections. You know, I like my uncle being part of Gagosian and Mary Boone and like all these big galleries. He knows every gallery, you know, and uh, as well as my my mother. And, you know, I'm just not that person. I I feel like I always need to work for something. It's so, it's very difficult because you're thinking, oh, these paintings are, you know, I feel it's great and it's cohesive. And I just want them in in a gallery. And then you start, you get to that point and you're like, wait, the work isn't as cohesive as it should be for a gallery. Maybe that's your perfection. That's exactly, yeah. It's <laughs> a, the other art fair came around and I'm like, okay, I don't, it doesn't have to be this 
gallery style representation of where everything's cohesive and you know and here there are a hundred artists under one roof I realized when I when I got there you're sort of critical among walking around judging the work who's creating it and I know that sounds a, a little negative but that's what we do I mean natural yeah got opinions and likes and dislikes and you know, there's work that everyone is drawn to and not drawn to. And <laughs> day one goes by, it, it's like the artist has to become a, a salesperson. And that is one of the most difficult things I think an artist has to accept. But for you personally, is that one of the hardest, that's the hardest thing? Is that was, that was very difficult. So the <laughs> day two goes by and day three and you're like, it's exhausting. And by the time it closes, I had more respect, whether I liked the work or not. The point being is I had so much respect for every single artist under that roof. I swear, I, f I felt like going around and being like, this is amazing. Like, you're, that's so great that, you know, you took this chance and the risk and being so vulnerable and, you know, everyone in that roof is it's the same feelings. I, I had a lot, a great deal of respect for everyone there. It's very difficult to put yourself out there like that and people walking by and, you know, those people, I know for sure they would walk by and you could tell they're just not interested. And for my first like sort of showing of a group of work, it's hard to accept all that. And then at the same time, I was incredibly proud of what I did. It's not that I ever second guessed. It's just, you want people to come up to you. You want people to ask questions. You want people, you know, and thank God for the fiberglass. People were very <laughs> interested. So a lot of people did come up. So that was a saving grace right there. But but it's 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 hard. To put yourself out there, yeah. Put yourself, and then there are people like you, when I, when I met you, it's a side of the art world that is so appreciated from an artist because I almost feel that every artist that is beginning, you know, that emerging sort of artist that I would almost, I would recommend everyone to do something like this because you, you will change your, your, your ideas, your visions, not your work, but the other side of the art world that we typically were either scared of or didn't want to face, you are faced with it. And there's no corner that you can go hide into because right. there are going to be people. And if you're not there, then no one's going to be interested in, you know, the background of your work. And, you know, so that's why I greatly appreciate what you do. Oh, thank you. You've opened up a lot of doors for me. I'm so glad. But what style would you say your paintings are? They're not, they're not abstract. I mean, some of the prints that you've done are abstract, but. It is difficult because I, you know, again, it, <laughs> I strived for so many years to figure out how I could do something a little different. I do feel it's unique in many ways, but at the same time, a lot of my inspirations do come through a lot. It's very much a bit of old soul kind of, and it, it probably had something to do with me being young and in New York City and getting to view all these amazing, amazing artists. And my uncle was, his neighbor was David Sally. I think he came from a bit of a commercial world as well. It could be, I might be thinking of James Rosenquist, but they both have a very designerly style, yet they're able to put these stories together, these narrations of, like being very narrative with 20 different sort of topics in one painting and I still have a tough time wrapping my head around that but I, I love it because it is done in more of a design kind of way and then you know and then you've got the Ed Ruchez who I, I've liked his painting since I was really young and I've gotten to see some shows of his when I was really young it is hard to pinpoint exactly what the work is but but we know who your influence is the influences are there for sure, but I, yeah. I, I like the idea that I'm trying to take it a little further and sort of the, the mediums that I'm working in, the, you know, and, and combining architecture, the sculpture side of it, where things become a little bit more dimensional painting. I've been able to 
have the, the luxury of discovering of, out of all that trial and error with the fiberglass. And I, I feel it really paid off. I, I tell you, even after finishing a fiberglass before I even paint on it, I feel grat gratification just from that alone because it's so difficult to create the structure. I already felt connected to it before I even start. And then it just opens up a whole door of like, oh my God, okay, so I'm gonna build this like abstract structure behind it. Wonderful. John, you uh, were an awesome, articulate guest. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm really glad that you were here. I'm really appreciating that you, you talking with me and giving our listeners a glimpse into your creative world. So for everyone listening, be sure to check out John's fabulous art at artdimensionsonline.com. If you have any questions, just let me know. John's Instagram also you can follow, which is, John, tell us your Instagram handle. It's uh, J-H-N B Hudson. Okay, so John B Hudson without the O in the John. Correct. Okay, great. You can also yeah. follow <laughs> at Art Dimensions on Instagram. We also have a new public Facebook group called Beyond the Palette, where we'll be talking about all things contemporary art. So be sure to join that group too. To John and to all the listeners out there, take great care. Before I wrap up or finish wrapping up, is there anything else you want to add? Uh, thank you for, for having me on this. I think it's great what you're doing with the community and bringing it all together. And I think it's really important. You're doing it very well too. So I oh. appreciate it. Thank you, John. That was awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Everybody take great care and happy creating. Bye.